What does publish or perish mean? Stick around and let's talk about it today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up, everybody? My name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, subscribe to our channel, and follow us on these social media accounts. So, today we're going to be discussing what the term publish or perish means in the context of academia. A lot of you requested this video because you're thinking to yourselves, kind of, what the heck does that mean? And you've heard it all the time, and so you wanted me to explain very briefly what people are talking about. So, what I want to do is to make three points that are going to clarify your thinking on this term. Point number one is that publications are the coin of the realm in academia. What this means is that by getting more peer-reviewed publications, you're going to end up having a higher likelihood of getting tenure, getting promoted, getting grants, getting training opportunities and keynotes so that you can travel and hopefully get paid for giving lectures. Uh, you can increase your reputation in the field because you're increasing your visibility. Publications are truly the coin of the realm. And this is why there is you know, a certain very interesting business system in academia where these different academic journals, and there are tens of thousands of them from different publishing houses, uh, but you know, when you submit something for publication and it gets published, those journals sell those articles. And when they sell them, you as an academic get nothing. You're not getting any piece of that pie, so they're making a lot of money. And a lot of people say, well, why do you do it? And this is why, because publications are the coin of the realm. And obviously, the higher the impact of the journal, the more visibility you're going to have, the more prestige comes along with it. By impact, there's this thing called an impact factor. Journals have them, uh, the good ones. And an impact factor essentially is a way of quantifying the influence, the research influence of a piece based on how many new pieces are getting published per year in a journal relative to how often pieces in the journal are being cited. And we can do a whole other video on H, uh, H indexes and impact factors if you want me to you can let me know down in the comments below. So, the more prestige that you have, the more, uh, the better that you're perceived to be in academia. This is such a key thing, guys, is that uh, in academia, everything is perception. So I always say that it's not just publications, but the coin to the realm is perceived respect. And it's nothing to do as to whether or not you're respected in the field, but the more that you perceive yourself as being respected, the higher you get in academia. It's the strangest thing. I have never run into this in any other field. Uh, when I've been in business, uh, now when I'm in more kind of social psychology and doing coaching and consultation, I, I really have never seen anything like this in any other field but competitive uh, academia. Interesting thing. The second point that I want to make is about something called mere exposure effect. This is a psychological phenomenon that you see in all fields of academia. The idea is that the more that you're exposed to a person or a theory or whatever it is, the more exposure you have to something, the more you like it. And this is one of the reasons why we like celebrities so much, is because if we see them on the big screen over and over and over again, we hear them being talked about on the news and media all the time, we end up really thinking that these guys are larger than life and more important than other people, etc., etc. And obviously, if we know people better, we're going to ascribe certain traits to them. And even people who are famous for the wrong reasons, for bad reasons, we tend to think that they're a bigger deal because we're hearing about them all the time. And we call this mere exposure effect. Now, in a, a very famous set of studies in dating and attraction, for example, uh, a set of researchers looked at marriage rates amongst college students, and they found that the closer you live to one another freshman year, the more likely you are to get married. And at first, people were really scratching their heads as to why this was. But it makes a lot of sense, right? You're going to see the people in, let's say, your freshman dorm way more than people 
people who live all the way across campus in another dorm. And so because of that, you get exposed to these people more often, you have more experiences with them, you're encountering them all the time, you kind of have to get along with them because they're in your tribe. And so because of that, you end up liking them more or at least feeling closer to them, even if you don't really like them as a human being. And it's the same thing when it comes to seeing somebody who publishes all the time. Even if you don't like them as human beings, their work coming out again and again and again, you're exposed to their name and their work, their theories, their beliefs in academia over and over. You're more likely to believe that this person is a really big deal. So one of the core things here in terms of publish or perish is to get that mere exposure effect, you gotta keep publishing. And it's not just about uh, how often you're publishing, so the speed at which you're publishing, but the quality, obviously, of the work that you're publishing. So there's a lot of pressure to come out with innovative stuff very often, and this obviously can be very stressful, but it's really important, especially when you're in early career. Uh, I have found as a general trend that even though there's exceptions, for the most part, as academics get older, they lose the hustle. They lose the hustle because they're already big names and people treat them like big names. So really, it's kind of like, why even hustle so hard anymore? I can get grants more easily because people know me and they know my publication record. I'm gonna be invited to co-author work and so because of that, I can still be getting publications without you know, having to do a ton of the labor and be the gopher uh, insofar as you know putting in a huge amount of, let's say, data analytic work and you know writing uh, the entire publications and all, unless they're first author or the sole author on something. Uh, they're gonna have more opportunities, and because of that, a lot of academics, they get lazy when they get older. But ironically, you have junior academics, I was in this, uh, this situation, right, where you see these big name people and you read all of their really influential work as an undergrad, then you say, whoa, grad school, I really wanna work with these people. And so there were a few universities that I didn't end up going to where this was the case. Oh my gosh, you know, these people were legendary, and I'm glad I didn't go because down the line, I ended up finding out that you know they barely do any you know, independent research anymore. It's like very little. They work on, you know, other teams and these sorts of things, but in terms of their own scholarly output, it's really not something where they're doing that work anymore. So it's something that people don't talk about in academia, but it's a practical reality. And per usual, guys, the important thing for me is that we not only talk about the great things about academia, but we're also really transparent about the downsides. But when you're early career, you need to be publishing really high quality work very, very often to get tenure, to be able to establish yourself in the field, so on and so forth. Oftentimes, these will be some of your most seminal publications, at least the ones that are really setting the stage for the rest of your career. Point number three is that the field forgets fast. Whatever field that you're in, this is always going to happen. Uh, there was a statistician back in the 1920s, uh, and his work I read when I was a grad student and trying to teach myself statistics, uh, multivariate stats, like really high level stats, uh, because at Oxford, you know, there, you don't take coursework, which some people is, are like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, no, you need to teach yourself everything because of that. And when you teach yourself multivariate statistics, especially when you went to grad school at a time like me, where nobody was going onto YouTube and looking at things. Uh, instead, we, we were like going to the library and opening books and like trying to teach ourselves from books multivariate stats. Oh my God, uh, it was wild. Uh, so during that process, I came across the work of this guy back in the mid-1920s uh, whose uh, tutorials on different forms of regression, so it's kind of like a prediction methodology, uh, regression blew my mind and helped me more than any other scholar in terms of understanding regression. Um, but the thing is, is that you know when I went around to other grad students, even other people in like epidemiology and statistics, and I would mention this guy because his work was published in journals that are still around and still very you know famous, arguably very high impact factors. They never heard of this person at all. Uh, and when I expose them to some of their work, they're like, whoa, yeah, this guy's really good. But it's one of these things where the field forgets quickly. And if you were out of the field for even a couple of years, unless you have some really seminal publications, you're gonna be forgotten really quickly. Uh, fields move really fast, and my last field of forensic risk assessment, we had over 100 publications coming out a year in the tiny little baby niche of you know forensic psychology that we were in, you know, trying to predict future violence. So small, and a small handful of researchers researchers in there, but publishing very, very often. 
and this was something that really blew my mind. And of course, it puts a lot of stress on you. It stresses you as an academic, the idea that you're gonna be forgotten so quickly. Every human being, you know, Freud used to talk about this, every human being, you know, we all wanna find a way to live forever. And because we biologically can't do it, we try to do it through our work in some way, shape, or form. But we all can't be Steve Jobs, we all can't be Freud, you know, so on and so forth. So we try to make our work really influential, and it can be a lot of pressure that we impose on ourselves, the idea that our work has to be seminal and you know lasting lifetimes, and uh, it's a lot of pressure. And so this is the other aspect of publish or perish. You will literally perish very quickly if you were not publishing frequently. And like I said, it's not just frequently, it's the quality of the publications. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining me today and watching this episode. I want to hear from you in the comments below. What do you think about this phenomenon of publish or perish? Have you run into this yourself? Maybe you've gotten out of the field of academia. Tell me about it. Yeah, I think everybody would really benefit from hearing about your publish versus perish experience. And did you find that all publications are created equal in terms of journal articles, books, book chapters, uh, conference abstracts, government white papers, etc.? Let's chat about it. Uh, and also, per usual, if you end up having a topic that you want to tackle in a future episode of Navigating Academia, post it down here and the more likes that I get on a particular suggestion, the more likely I'll be to make a video on it for you. Don't forget to take a moment right now to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students. Subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career coaching with me, sign up for a consultation call down at this website and let's talk a little bit about how you can beat this system of publish versus perish, how you can make more money with side hustles, leveraging the skills you already have as an academic, getting a book proposal published. There's so many things we can talk about. Sign up. Signing off, everybody. Have a great day, and don't forget to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here, as always. If you enjoyed this video, and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.